Thanks very much. It's, uh, it's great to be here and uh, privileged to speak to you all. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, Murray Shanahan as well for introducing the topic so clearly, and it actually made my job a little bit easier. Um, he was talking about machines gaining a general understanding. And I would like to put it to you that a lot of our understanding comes from the sound that we hear all around us. This event would be pretty much a waste of time if we switched off all the sound uh, in the room. And so uh, interacting with AI through sound uh, is crucial, I believe. And uh, it's a topic that's been developing over quite some time, but has still a long way to go. And i just put this little Google search up. I, I looked at machine vision. Uh, you might call it computer vision, which is a classical application. And then I put in machine hearing. And, well, the differences are enormous. On the left-hand side, if you can't see it, 750,000 hits on Google Scholar. For machine hearing, 469. So this, for me, is a gap and an opportunity. Um, the use of sound in everyday devices has been evolving, and I just got a few little um, silly pictures to, to, to make some fun of this. But back in the 90s, audio technology uh, made a big transition. It's not new, but it became very cheap. And young people could then have uh, these Nokia candy bar phones. I used to have one. They were great. The battery lasted forever. Um, and uh, mobility became an established requirement of the way that we interact with infrastructural systems. Uh, in the 2000s, we moved on to hands-free phones, which weren't actually hands-free. You can see she's actually holding it in her hand. Um, but it inspired video calling, perhaps, and new ways of interacting. Uh, this was the uh, original HTC phone there. We move on uh, to the next generation, maybe into the uh, earlier part of the 21st century. 2010, we have uh, these kind of iPhone devices. And the interesting thing now is that they really are hands-free. Uh, you can walk around, you can talk while you walk, and this picture, picture particularly shows robustness to interference of background noise, in this case, two people talking in the background. And that is crucial because the so-called cocktail party effect, which was first, uh, the phrase was first coined by Professor Colin Cherry, who had the office upstairs from me at Imperial College, uh, in his book uh, from 1959 on human communication. And this ability to separate sound from a mush and a mixture of sounds uh, is really something humans do well and machines fail at. But now we're starting to see technology which can address that. And of course the famous things uh, maybe uh, in recent, very recent years are home automation and Amazon Echo and Google Voice and all this kind of stuff. So there's a push and Unlike Murray's graph, which was going up and down and up and down, I'd like to suggest that audio technology is pretty monotonic, but much uh, shallower gradient. So we've seen growth, uh, but we don't have this hype, uh, which tends to kind of oscillate around things. So smart devices are clearly a big driver in the technology, but there are many others. And I particularly would point to IoT, Internet of Things, and perhaps wrap robots into that in some sense, at least from the audio perspective, um, hearing aids, um, if we're lucky, we will get to use a hearing aid, by which I mean to say if we're lucky, if we live long, then probably our ears will give up before our bodies do. The medical science is good enough to keep us living longer than our ears were designed to last. And so probably the majority of people in this room, uh, if you're lucky, uh, will need a hearing aid. Uh, this technology is pretty ancient, and, and there are lots of issues of vanity and uh, usability of these devices, so there's plenty of uh, options for extending technology into those. Automotive is a big driver. We talk about uh, self-driving cars. And any application with lots of data that's spoken, and healthcare uh, is a big one, where there are lots of medical reports. The enablers for this technology, which are very timely at the moment, include MEMS technology. So these kind of devices now have microphones in them that are built from um, uh, MEMS technology. They cost 70 cents. Now, when the device costs 70 cents, you can have a lot of them without increasing the manufacturing cost too much. And they're digital. You don't need A to D converters. Nice digital interface. 
uh, you can put the microphones wherever you like. Low power wireless, so now hearing aids and maybe even Apple AirPods, we could, those kind of devices can have a wireless link between the two ears. So those devices can now operate in tandem, which of course is exactly what human ears do in order to spatialize sound. Better ways to handle uncertainty, now that's what I call machine learning. <laughs> so generalizing uh, from uncertainty. And we might think of, and, and some of my colleagues proposed that speech has a huge, a hugely greater level of uncertainty than many other forms of information. For example, if you're trying to do face detection, the, diff the distance between the eyes does not change when you have a cold. Yeah? But if you're trying to recognize someone's voice, their voice really does change if they have a cold, for example. So we need good ways to handle uncertainty. And so the speech community, speech processing community, may claim that they even invented DNNs. Um, I'm not sure everyone would agree with them, but they're certainly a huge customer for that technology. And everybody in this room has access to Google Voice or Siri using that technology for speech recognition. So I thought I'd just spend a couple of minutes to uh, look at some of the current research which is going on in my lab. Uh, just, this is very quick, so please excuse me for, for skipping across the different topics. Robot audition is about in, uh, uh, giving robots the same kind of auditory awareness as humans have. So awareness means for sure understanding speech, but also understanding the environment and the other uh, uh, objects within that environment that make sound. We're interested in assistive hearing devices. Interestingly, the biggest market for assistive hearing devices is not hearing impaired people, but normal hearing people who may use these kind of uh, AirPod kind of devices, which could uh, perhaps give them better quality sound. At the moment, we use this mic and the speakers. Why don't I just beam my sound straight into your little uh, in-ear device or at the train station to have the announcements directly? Ambient noise reduction is still a big issue. We work on this for hearing aids, uh, for binaural speech enhancement in particular. And uh, for all systems operating in the real world, there is never only one talker. The cocktail party effect dominates real life, and we have to be able to diarize, that means deciding who is talking when, in order to make sense of the audio. We understand reverberation, so you know now you're in a big room because it's, it's a bit echoey, yeah? but if you're in a small room, you would have a different perception of the acoustic space. Reverberation, on the other hand, completely damages speech recognition. It's catastrophically bad, like the error rate is 98% easily. So we need de-reverberation techniques to remove the reverberation, the echoes from, from room acoustics. Um, and we either do that by identifying the acoustic channel between the talker's lips and the microphones and then trying to invert it. Um, or we might actually exploit the reverberations by working out where the echoes come from and then grabbing the sound from the echoes and merging it with the direct sound in order to improve the signal-to-noise ratio. That's called a rake receiver. Not only is uh, speech important, but we also work a little bit on bioacoustics. So if you um, listen to your knee joint with a, a vibrational microphone, you can pick up sounds which may be also indicative of uh, early diagnosis of osteoarthritis of the knee. Let me do a slightly deeper dive into a couple of topics now. Um, and the first one would be to highlight robot audition. I've already mentioned a few of the, the different uh, research challenges. Uh, they're written up here. Um, De-reverberation, room inference, so trying to work out something about the room, dealing with multiple talkers. Uh, acoustic slam is a recent breakthrough, I would say, that we've been uh, able to make, which is where robots using only passive acoustic sensing, so they don't make any emitted sound, just the natural sounds in the room, can work out where they are in the room in respect, in respect to uh, other sound sources in the room autonomously. And this is particularly interesting because simultaneous localization and mapping is well known in the area of, for example, radar, where you can receive range and bearing information, so the, the distance and the angle. But in audio, we can only get the angle, so we have to solve this ambiguity, and uh, we, we recently published a, a breakthrough paper on that, which I'm very proud of. 
We do a lot of our work in the so-called spherical harmonic domain. Now, I won't go into the technicalities of this, but uh, just to make a few uh, highlights uh, about this way of processing sound, the idea is that we can decompose a sound field into a set of orthogonal harmonics. Now, some of you might know about frequency analysis of signals, where we can express a signal as the sum of some sines and cosines. And uh, we do the similar idea in space, and we call them spherical harmonics in space, and this is particularly handy because it allows us to rotate sound fields. We have these beautiful pictures of spherical harmonics, and any sound field can be formed by a linear combination of these shapes in order to produce a particular sound field. And if we do that in the right way, we can make beams of directivity which can be steered in 3D. So uh, we can have a highly directional microphone which can just track one particular speaker or another. And in fact, you can have multiple things simultaneously. And they're also scalable with more microphones, as in the right-hand side, we can make it a bit sharper in terms of the beam sensitivity. We can also uh, look at room acoustics in terms of the channel characteristics, the acoustic channel. In the top diagram, we see a room impulse response, which is what an acoustician would measure if they were characterizing the direct sound. You can see at the left-hand side of the blue curve at the top, a strong impulse, which is the direct sound. And then you can see lots of other impulses, which are the reflections coming a little bit later, the reflected sounds off the wall or the floor. And if we use the beamformer in the middle graph, we can suppress some of those reflections, thereby removing reverberation. Speech recognition works better. And if we combine together lots of the reflections by uh, a rake receiver, which I mentioned briefly earlier, we can do even better in the bottom graph. Let me finish off with a couple of slides just on hearing aids. So there is this new opportunity in the wireless link between the ears. Now, this is not something that's been available before. Audiologists used to fit hearing aids independently, but now we can exploit this using beamformers. And uh, those beamformers, in order to be optimal, need an understanding of the noise in the room. So we spend a lot of time characterizing acoustic noise, usually through a mathematical tool which we call a spatial covariance matrix. Okay, don't worry about the details. It's the statistics of the noise. But we have to estimate this on the fly. And just as a little illustration, in the case of a hearing aid or a robot head, it rotates. Now, that means that if you work out the noise with the head in this position, by the time the head is rotated, your estimate is wrong again. So you have to re-estimate it. So that's a huge uh, problem. It's not a, only a computational problem, but it's an algorithmic problem as well. So we need to find better ways. Here's a listener and a talker. And if the noise is all around equally, we call that isotropic noise, then as you rotate your head, the noise estimate from one location is correct as you turn it. But this is a very special case of isotropic noise. In the real world, we don't have that. We have noise coming from more from one direction than from another. And so we need to find a way to, to solve this problem in order to do beamforming. And the technique that we use here is to actually estimate the noise in world coordinates using these spherical harmonic decompositions, which I spoke about briefly, and then to map the world coordinates to an arbitrary head rotation, exploiting a head tracking sensor, X, Y, and Z head tracking sensor, in the hearing aids or the robot head. And this allows us to get some extremely good beamforming results. Um, and uh, this slide is just some very recent results, so let me talk, talk about it just for a moment. Uh, what we've got here is the uh, beamforming performance in terms of the signal-to-noise ratio. So uh, on the left-hand side, we've got on the vertical axis the excess signal-to-noise, uh, excess noise, rather, uh, compared to an oracle estimator. So if we knew exactly the noise, what could we do? And at the top, we've got the figures uh, 15 to 17 dB of signal-to-noise ratio. If we use uh, static models, it's uh, the left-hand <coughs> lines here. If we use existing baselines, uh, it's the kind of orangey colors. And the new method is the kind of the yellowy colors. And the take-home message from this is that we're able to achieve nearly zero excess error. So it's as good as it could be, in other words, if we had the exact knowledge of the noise. So using some of these acoustic signal processing techniques allow us to build optimal beamformers that allow us 
to address this um, cocktail party problem that we can focus in spatially on different sounds. And just to conclude, I'll just throw out a few hints about things which are kind of uh, in the pipeline. Um, audio is infrastructure. So everybody's phone uh, connects to the Wi-Fi of the room that they're in pretty much automatically. Why can't it do the same with audio infrastructure? You know, why are you limited to the microphones in your device? Why can't you uh, link all of these together? Um, particularly for robots, as a robot enters a room, can it start to then exploit audio infrastructure in terms of microphones and loudspeakers in that room? Gaze-directed beamforming, one of the problems with hearing aids is knowing what sound to select. If you get it wrong, it's not helpful. And so uh, the idea of using uh, pupil tracking spectacles uh, as a guide to where the beamforming should be pointed is something we're starting to investigate. Um, and then controlled sound zones for privacy. It's a kind of crowded world. It would be nice to find somewhere where you could have a, um, a chat without it being too noisy. And as a, a holy grail application, imagine walking into a, a crowded restaurant putting your device in the center of the table and pressing cloak. And an acoustic cloak falls down over you. And it doesn't cut out the noise, but at least it reduces the background noise so you can have a calm conversation. And furthermore, other people may not find it so easy to eavesdrop your conversation. Now, we can't do that in 2019, but this is a stimulating uh, approach that, that we certainly address for future research directions. Thank you very much.